you did say you believed in the Nicene Creed and the the bodily resurrection mm -hmm. of Christ, right? I believe in the Nicene Creed, the uh, bodily resurrection of Christ. Nicene, would be something that the, the Nicene bodily Creed, Creed is part of the re Nicene Creed. Yeah, but I don't necessarily know that I agree in the literal truth of the resurrection of Jesus. I do believe that Jesus is God, and that's the way that I symbolically understand my faith tradition, right? Uh, but I have complicated views on this subject matter. Like I said, my interpretation of my religious convictions is non-chauvinist, uh, and it includes the conviction that there are a wide variety of ways that people could understand their route to accessing the divine. Uh, and that can include other religious belief systems as well. Uh, Matt, the, this does it does feel kind of like you're telling me you believe in the Nicene Creed, but then you're just redefining it to not believe in the literal words of the Nicene Creed. Well, there are certain parts of it that I agree with, right? I believe that Jesus is the son of God. Uh, well, sure, but you could say that about Muslims, right? Muslims believe in certain parts of the Nicene Creed too, right? Yeah, absolutely, right? But I mean, I don't necessarily need to buy into everything that the Bible says. And I mean, nobody does, right? Uh, I mean, my faith tradition is something that I've reconstructed out of my own theological convictions uh, about what the best understanding of Christianity happens to be. It's informed, like I mentioned, uh, by a number of different Christian theologians like Tillich and Diver and a number of others uh, that stress the importance of less the formal aspects of Christianity and more the moral imperative of Christianity to engage in good works. Uh, and this includes a political dimension where it is absolutely essential that we should be doing more in order to look after the least well off, where I feel that our society has been very deficient in many kinds of respects, right? So yeah, I believe in looking after the least well off. That's what motivates my positions on the whole drug thing that we disagreed with. But you know. sure, but I mean, we have different means and different conceptions about what that would entail pretty clearly, right? Uh, and your circumstance, and you've made this very clear, you think that one of the ways to deal with something like drug dealers, for example, would be to institutionalize them, right? Uh, and I imagine take a more draconian drug stance. Drug dealers, I'd probably just throw in jail, but drug, Sorry, users, drug users, I would definitely right? institutionalize them. Yeah, in drug hospital. users and drug dealers, right? You should, they should be institutionalized, right? I don't actually think that that's the right way to go about doing this. Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, I, I think the bigger problem is just the, the sort of, I mean, the problem is, is that Christianity has a certain kind of meaning to it that's it's very consistent. And I, I with all of these progressive forms of Christianity, it, it feels like progressivism with, with a, a, a Christian skin suit, right? I mean, it, it, it does seem, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Matt, like the sort of the Christianity that, that you talk about in your articles on Zizek, it, it sounds like you believe that an individual creates their own meaning themselves. Well, that's an interpretation of Zizek's. Uh materialist Christianity and not necessarily my own theological convictions, right? So Jesus' interpretation of Christianity is highly idiosyncratic, uh, but it's derived largely from the writings of Jorge Hegel, right? Uh, so Hegel famously interpreted the book of Genesis uh, to be a story, if you want to put it really simply, uh, about man's emancipation from nature rather than a Sure, sure. I know. It's, an, it's basically not. I mean, it's not even original. It's Gnostic. That's Gnostic's interpretation, too. Well, not necessarily, right? Uh, because Gnosticism has a somewhat different interpretation of the history leading up to Christian thought and the history after Christian thought. Sure, sure. We can't get into the distinction. Yeah, but we, we don't. We don't need to, right? But Jesus materialist Christianity isn't coextensive with my own, right? What I think is interesting about it uh, is again this notion of Christianity as a transitional, as a religion that symbolically indicates the transition of human beings from natural beings to self-conscious beings. And I think that it did really a brilliant job of articulating this symbolic transition or this transition, in fact, however you just want to conceive it, in the Genesis myth and in the broader swath of biblical stories. So I also, think this actually is a big disagreement between two of us. I, with, with me, I, I need... The, Language needs to be incredibly clear and concise and simple. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the ability of language to expand past its ability to be analyzed is a core belief of mine. When you do analytical, and we had to scream on Twitter about this, I don't know if I emphasize this enough, when you do formalized theoretical construction and jargon, the complexity of the idea goes up exponentially and your analytical ability is linear. So as you add on jargon and caveats and uh, embellishments on sort of simple ideas, your understanding of it will actually decrease, not increase, as you do the analysis. 
And this is what I deeply believe about philosophy of things like Hegel and Plato is I think that the theorizing about them is almost useless because I think the utility is in the meditation. I, I think the utility is in the spirit. And the with, utility is in the spirit of philosophy. Yeah, and I think Hegel is a great example of this. I've read several of Hegel's books and they're like Greek. Like you can't, I can't. I could read them five times and not, and I had literally two PhDs in it. Like, I, no, I've met three PhDs in Hegel and they all gave me, they all renounce each other's points of view. On, oh, they do, yeah. Things. Like, okay, well, that's 200 years old, right? 200 years of this and we couldn't come up with any consistent reading of one of the biggest philosophers of all time. Like that would never happen in science. That would never happen in science. So, I mean, but, but, but I will say this about Hegel. His, his his idea of dialectics and history, like it kind of works in a weird way. It does. Right? Yeah. It kind of works in a weird way. So, I mean, and, and the same thing with platonic forms too. Although there, there are people like Kurt Gödel who did actually formalize Platonism, interestingly enough. He did, and he was actually a very big fan uh, of the ontological proof of God's existence. Um, oh, yeah. Little there known are, fact about him, right? There are versions of it, but that's not the cool. The reason why people like Plato was not in anticipation of when Kirk Girdle, I'm sure he wasn't the first person to formalize it. No. It was not an indication of when we could write it down in a formal language. It was because Plato and perhaps vicariously Socrates has a certain spirit of wisdom that carries through the text that's greater than the analysis itself. Now, when it comes to religion, Christianity has a very consistent spirit and a very consistent set of answers. And I feel when we when we twist the words to mean what they don't want to mean, what we're doing is we're allowing ourselves to inject our own preferences into Christianity. Like there's things that I don't like about Christianity and I can't change them. Right? Sure, but I mean, th this is where you and I differ about what the best interpretation of Christianity should be, right? Because from my perspective, Christianity could never uh, be conducive to any kind of reactionary viewpoint, right? And we don't need to get into the nuts and bolts about this, but let's go back to the kind no, of- No, that, that's a little bit why. Okay, well, this is what I'm getting at, right? So let's talk about somebody like Joseph de Maistre, who I think can demarcate the distinction between us, I think, a little bit more clearly, right? Uh -huh. uh, Joseph de Maistre would probably be very empathetic towards your position. Uh, in a famous work... He yeah, I'm, I'm basically copying it from him there. Yeah, yeah, I figured, right? So in a very famous series of passages, he talks about how it is that submitting important political and moral questions to the deliberation and rationalization of everybody will undo respect for authority because everybody will have a different opinion about what the truth is and what is moral. Uh, and consequently, there'll be no consensus. Uh, and so the best thing for people would be rather than adopting an inquiring uh, position when it comes to big ontological, theological and moral questions, instead to insist that they treat them like dogmas. Because if yeah, I mean, I, I, look, you can go more right wing than Christian. Like you can go to like the perfect example of this would be the infamous story, the Grand Inquisitor from Brothers Karamazov. Beautiful you can yeah. get more right wing than Jesus. And, and it's not my job to get more right wing than Jesus. I, and this is like my original saying, like I don't have a principle towards hierarchy. Okay, but okay. Let, let, okay, let, let me finish, right? This is, again, where you see different conceptions of what religion is supposed to be about, and for that matter, what different conceptions of what philosophy is supposed to be about, right? Uh, this emphasis on not submitting moral, political, and ontological questions to genuine spec general speculation in order to maintain dogmatic respect for authority is something that a lot of reactionaries have broad sympathy for. Uh, and there are reasons to have broad sympathy for them because that's conducive to order because most people aren't yeah, able sure. to inquire into philosophical questions very effectively. And also because quite frankly, too much disruption can lead to the disintegration of society and the reemergence of the state of nature and the war of all against all. Okay. Right? Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the distinction is that progressives have always emphasized the importance of virtue as flowing from this continuous interrogation uh, of the truth by an engaged and active citizenry, uh, because we see this as conducive to A, the good life individually, uh, and B, the civic life generally. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why progressives, including progressive Tristans, tend to be attracted to democracy, because under ideal circumstances, this is a situation where people individually and collectively are required to do just what Demetra says that they shouldn't do, constantly inquire into these kinds of questions. Uh, and yeah, you can deconstruct anything, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and most progressives would see this as inherently a kind of virtuous activity. Uh, and there are reasons for this that go back to what <laughs> I was Unless about. you do to progressive principles, then they'll get, they'll freak out. Well, no, I think that if anything, what you've seen recently has been a very robust debate on the left about a wide variety of issues. And certainly within liberalism, there's been just an endless series of debates about what is entailed by liberalism.
right? Um, I'm thinking more like the like equality stuff, especially around like race and stuff like that. Sure, sure. Well, let's not get into that because we've already yeah, covered we so won't. But stuff. I mean, I, I don't see like my job is to be follow Christ, not just to be right wing. Like, yeah, I adopt right wing positions because they're implied by the faith and some left wing ones. Like, I'm not the Grand Inquisitor from Dostoevsky here. Like, I'm not. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. But I mean, the reason why I'm reactionary is because society has gone way to the left past Christian orthodoxy. And so most of the mistakes, I mean, I spent like half the summer arguing with right in a chains. So I'm not unfamiliar with debates against right wingers, but like, that's not. Sorry, I wrote a, I wrote a collection on Nietzsche uh, that came out recently. So I, I empathize. That's a hard struggle. <laughs> uh, but listen, the point that I was getting at with the maestro, right. Is that I think that, Deep down, uh, there's a part of you that is concerned with the disintegrationist or deconstructive effect that too much inquiry will have yeah. over the broad swath of society. Would we agree on that? Yeah, right? that's definitely okay. a problem. So if you wanted to demarcate what separates the left from the right on both religious and political questions of this matter, uh, it would be that most uh, uh, sorry, most reactionaries and most conservatives would probably be attracted to some iteration of the Demetrian or Burkean argument for that matter, whereas progressives tend to see something virtuous in itself about adopting the Socratic disposition of continuously inquiring into the nature of truth, continuously putting it under pressure and trying to generalize that into a broader political principle, right? There's a reason that Socrates says he wants to live in the city because it's only in the city that it can engage in his dialectic, right? Now, how to go about doing that has obviously been an subject to an ongoing debate on progressives, including amongst progressive progressions. Uh, but sure. the feeling is that by encouraging people to do that, you get something like what Kant described, uh, where by requiring people to interrogate their own belief systems uh, and to subject them to rational scrutiny, they will A, develop the virtue of intellectual curiosity, uh, and B, ultimately come to stand by their convictions uh, in a more forceful kind of way than they would under dogmatic circumstances, because now they've had to arrive at a self-conscious disposition where they agree with what they believe in, rather than having it imposed upon them as some kind of dogma. But how does that make it, I mean... You're saying that Christianity has some progressive element into it. And I agree with that. It's not the most right-wing thing in the world, right? But No, not at all. And I think that, again, this is one of the things that you see consistently uh, in various forms of left-wing Christianity, right? So take, for example, somebody like Soren Kierkegaard, right? Yeah, was, I mean, yeah you can get to the – I mean, it's, I think it's – I think we're overcomplicating this, right? There are some elements in Christianity that have right-wing conclusions, and there are some elements in Christianity sure. that have left-wing conclusions. And, I mean, the point is not just to be as right-wing as possible. The point is to, like I said before, there's two imperatives, the survival of the human race mm -hmm. and the communion of the human race with God. Those are the two primary political imperatives. And sub to that, I want to preserve my people and my faith tradition into the future. Uh if what you are proposing helps that objective, then that's fine. I don't care if it's left wing or not. But okay, well, I'm glad. And so maybe we can reach some kind of consensus on that, which might actually be a nice place to end on, right? Because okay. I think that what you would see both left wing and right wing Christians agree upon uh, is this notion that it is deeply important for social policies to address the spiritual and cultural rot that is latent within our society. Uh, and that seems to have ubiquitous and damaging effect on people across the board. Okay. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I I've, I need to get a few super chats to you because I know you have to go. The one creeper weirdo asks, "What does a good leftist or left wing family look like, and do we need to remove right wing families for them to exist?" No, I don't think that we need to remove right wing families, right? I mean, I should point out, right? Uh, a lot of my friends growing up were very conservative and still are very conservative, and many of them have very happy family lives. And we meet and we argue about politics, as I'm sure you do with your progressive family. Uh, and we all get along reasonably well, right? But I would never mm -hmm. deny that conservatives can be upstanding uh, family men, uh, and even for that matter, upstanding members of their community, okay? Well, I mean, uh, right now, there's a huge deficit of progressive families in our generation. Uh, the, that could very the, well be, but I would argue that that a lot of that has to do with the fact that it's very difficult to form meaningful family units in these kinds of circumstances because people are at an economic disadvantage for a lot of reasons uh, when it comes to doing so. Uh, and I would argue that there are right. also, there the, the, are the, also yeah, the, 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 this thing, I'll just give you this little piece of information. The difference gets bigger, the richer people get, or the more educated they get. So, you know, if you're underclass, if you're working class, 
uh, the conservative guy will have a slightly larger family. Once you get to like PhD levels, like the conservative guy has a medium family and the progressive guy has like no family or no kids. Well, so I, it gets more radical as you go up the educational level. So I don't really see the economics to be a good explainer of that. 